analogies are one of the most powerful ways people can communicate technical knowledge. It's actually one of the things that happens when we become experts in a field is part of our expertise is based on our ability to generalize and conceptualize and move away from the concrete. And so analogies can be really powerful because they tend to be much more concrete. And so they're often a really effective way to communicate to non-technical audiences. Similar to an analogy, but slightly different, is also to use a specific example. And uh, technical people often struggle with this because the specific example isn't generalized and may have qualities about it that don't perfectly generalize, but actually audiences are much better at going from the specific to the general. So for example, if I were to describe to you someone um, whose desk every night was completely empty with just a pad of paper and a pen placed halfway between the top and the bottom of that pad, you'd probably generalize that that's a pretty organized person. But if I told you that someone was organized and then asked you to describe their desk, it's really hard to do. So both analogies and specific examples can work really well to communicate to audiences because they're so concrete. And so one of the ways to communicate better is to try and use illustrations that are much more concrete. I struggle with this issue of how do you correct a non-expert in their domain uh, without coming across as a know-it-all. One of the things I've learned is first, ask yourself if, you, if this is really important to correct. Uh, I work and study graphs and slides in business communication. That is, that is what I think about my entire professional life. And I have learned that if I'm not asked, that I should not volunteer my, my expertise unprompted to somebody else. So make sure that it's an area that they are interested in or that it has real importance other than how much it bothers you to see bad slides in the world. More practically, you have to start from where they are. And one of the things to remember is that people often think that other people's mis um, misunderstanding is based on the wrong knowledge. And that so simply if they're given information, that they'll change their understanding. And there's actually a second component in understanding that's important, which is this idea of a mental model. People both have a set of information and a model in their head of how the world works and what that information means, how it's filtered through that model in order to come to a conclusion. And so you actually want to start by getting curious. You want to start by getting curious about that other person's knowledge base and their mental model. And with that curiosity, you'll often see better ways to be able to address where either the gaps or misunderstandings in their thinking are, rather than coming in and just trying to teach them a lecture. That's not a good idea unless they've signed up for a lecture. Trust me on that one. So sometimes you, you have done all the planning, you've done all the things right, and you find yourself in front of an audience and it is going sideways. Either they don't understand or the discussion's headed off in a weird direction. One of the first things to do is to notice your own reaction because it can be really tempting in those situations to then wanna try to overpower the discussion or sort of wrestle the audience back in the direction. And actually that kind of aggressiveness doesn't tend to work super well in my experience. So the first thing you wanna do is just remind yourself that it's like, it is okay. These things happen. Take a moment and calm down. Maybe let the audience actually go on for a while. Let a person ask their full question and vent themselves out. And then you have to start over and you have to basically rewind to wherever you lost them. And that can be really frustrating because there's a real chance that you have 10 minutes left in a meeting and 20 minutes more content to get through and you lost them 15 minutes ago. And one of the things is to accept the like, you can only get people so far in so much time and to mentally accept is like, okay, we're gonna rewind. We're gonna get as far as we can. And I, you're gonna have to think about this as an ongoing communications process that you're going to have to get back to them on. 
um, and just continue to work on over time. And I know that is unsatisfying, but that is part of the communications process. One of the challenges of mixed cultural audiences is that their context and their framework and often the way they decode things, especially um, signals and cultural signals that we're not aware of can be different. And so the more diverse and the more heterogeneous your audience gets, generally the simpler your communication has to be. And so one of the critical things to do that I don't think people spend enough time on is really thinking about your audience before every communication to understand what are the things that I have in common with this audience in terms of my knowledge base and what are things that are different. For example, if you're giving a highly technical presentation in your domain field to people from the same domain field, but different cultures, maybe they've been trained in a similar kind of science and technical communication. And that actually isn't gonna be a significant issue. But there's another version of that where people are from the same maybe regional or country culture that you are, but came up from a sales organization background versus an engineering organization background. And actually that can be a very significant difference in cultural context. And you need to think about it a lot the same way, which is, okay, I have to remember that my audience is diverse and heterogeneous. As a result, the ideas that I'm going to be able to express here are going to have to be simpler and more abstracted versions of it. I'm going to have to focus much more on the impact that this, that this has on them, and I'm going to have to take less for granted. One of the big just first steps to take is just think about your audience beforehand so you can activate the part of your brain that is noticing that. And then over time, as you notice, you'll begin to get better. If the audience is really culturally dissimilar to you, then you want to seek out someone who can be your translator or your guide, someone who's in that culture and understands that cultural context better and can help you work through what aspects of your communication are going to work and what things you want to think about differently for that culture. So reading is in some ways much more challenging than verbal communication and in some ways much easier. So one of the ways that it is more challenging is that you have to be much more structured in a written communication than you are in a verbal communication. So you really don't want to, generally don't want to just type out your long response to something or write out a presentation in the order that you thought of it and then send it. You really want to add in a step where you think about going back and structuring it really carefully and having a very clear structure so that people can follow because you have no chance to, to revise in the middle like you do when you're talking. That said, just you may have no chance to revise in the middle, but your audience does have a chance to be able to go back and reread things over again and read at their own pace. So while written and read communications have to be more structured, they can actually have higher degrees of technical detail in them than generally verbal conversations can because the audience can more easily skip over, stop and look things up. And while you can't be infinite, you go to really, really deep technical detail for those audiences, whatever the level of technical detail you could go at verbally, you can probably up that a notch or two when you're in, when you're in writing. So more structure, more structure and slightly more detail are available to you. 